Oh yeah! Welcome in everybody! This is Cream of the Crop, a fantasy hockey podcast presented by Apples and Genos. You come for the apples and you stay for the Genos. Am I right? Come on! I'm your host, Blake Creamer. Please follow me on Twitter slash X. It's at Blake Creamer AG. Apples and Genos does have a Discord as well. The link is in the description. You click it and you get to talk to me. You get to talk to other fantasy guys just doing stuff we got like-minded fantasy managers in there so lots of good discussions also we have some best ball drafts that are happening so definitely come in and check that out okay also while i got you you gotta rate the pod do me a solid i'm not gonna tell you what to do but any rating will do you you know come, come on don't be petty all right give it give us a five if you got it all right that's nice um but that's not why we're here all right the adp battles must continue and there can be only one i've, I've taken some hits from from some fantasy legends here and it's going to be no different today i'm going to probably going to get smashed and that's fine uh, i got myself a fantasy ringer here and no that's not what it sounds like I, i'm talking a fantasy hockey beast all right i need to test my skills this guy right here is going to do that for me he's the managing editor at and senior writer at daily faceoff and the co-host of the puck poolies podcast plus he's got a beautiful head of hair Matt Larkin, welcome in, buddy. Thank you so much for joining me. How was your summer? Blake, it's a pleasure to be on. I'm excited for these ADP battles. I used to have a, a title belt, like a WWE title belt behind me, but I, I lost it because I, I lost the fantasy league in which I originally had it. It's too bad. It would have been intimidating to have that belt behind me as we threw down, uh, but it's a pleasure to be here and I'm feeling good. Summer's coming to an end. I think I'm ready for it. I'm sweating buckets. It's a little too humid for September. Bring on October. Bring on those leaves. Yeah, there you go. Matt has uh, told me that his AC is not uh, working currently. So, you know, we're, we're going to try and, you know, I, and maybe it's an advantage me, right? It's a little little bit sweaty in there. So I don't know. I'll take everything I, I, I can get here because, yeah, this is going to be interesting. But, buddy, thank you so much for making time. I really appreciate that. Um, this has been a really fun, fun little segment here, ADP Battles. We've had lots of uh, great guests on here, good conversations. So I'll give you just the basic premise of the show, everyone. You, you know the drill, but we're going to tell you anyway, all right? Uh, Matt and I are going to be looking at two players close in ADP, and we're going to decide who we would take at that position and then give our reasons why and hopefully just some, some healthy debate. You know, I'm glad that uh, title belt isn't in the background because I, I don't need to be intimidated any more than I already am now. All right, please, come on. Don't, don't do me like that, all right? Uh, okay. I'm just yammering on. That's what I do, Matt. So yeah, there we go. Um, let's get to it. Let's get into the battle. You ready to do battle, Matt? I'm ready. I'm as ready as I'm ever going to be. And, uh, let's just see if I end up in a puddle of sweat by the end of this. Damn that air conditioner. But you know what? It, at least it feels like I'm, I'm doing hot yoga or something like that. Right. So maybe I'll burn a few calories during this battle. I'm okay with it. That's nice. You sweat out the toxins, right? That's, that's where I'm at as well. Yeah, actually. So, uh, that'd be good for me. All right, let's get to it. Here we go. All right, Matt, we're in our fantasy uh, drafts here, okay? And I, I did forget to mention, we'll, we didn't talk about format, but we'll just say points league with, you know, of some minor banger waiting, right? Um, I don't think that's going to change any of our picks here, but you're in round one and we're at the turn. We're at pick 12 and you're staring at Kale McCarr and Brady Kachuk. Who are you taking, Matt? I think it's a reasonably tough decision if you're in a banger format where shots are weighted heavily, hits, of course, because Brady Kachuk is probably the only player with a chance to lead the league in both those categories in the same season. That said, if we're in a more traditional format, you got to go Kale McCarr. I think people forget how young he still is. He's 24 years old. He theoretically still has not even peaked yet. And I still think we have not seen the Kale McCarr season. Even last year, obviously shortened by injury his season, he was still at a 90-point pace. So to me, you could ask the question, is 90 points his floor in a full season? There's no other defenseman in the last 30 years, including Eric Carlson. We can get to him later. Maybe he'll come up. But no other defenseman in the last 30 years for whom we can say 90 points is the floor. Kale McCarr is a unicorn. It's like having Rob Gronkowski in his prime at tight end in fantasy football. I love that. Um, yeah, I, I love that take, too, that maybe we haven't seen the best of Kale McCarr, right? He's a young guy, and he's had some injuries, right? Um, so I, I love McCarr this season. To me, uh, truthfully, I think McCarr is the right answer. It has to be the answer here at 12. I think even at 12, you're loving McCarr. Like, I, I could I could see the the case for taking him even a pick or two earlier than that. You know, he's by far the best D-man, no question. There's also the value over replacement argument that you can make with McCarr, right? He's clearly the best defenseman. So 
that said, I got to make a case for Brady Kachuk. I'm, I'm, I'm trialing a new nickname for Brady Kachuk, the Woodchuck. All right. Brady, the Woodchuck Kachuk. All right. Eat. Well, how do you feel about this, Matt? Is this is this reasonable? I think it has the right kind of connotations for someone who can just do a fair amount of damage, demolition out there on the ice. I like it. Okay. All right. Well, that's, that's, uh, you know, certified by uh, Matt Larkin. He's, uh, he approves this message. All right. So we're going to talk about Brady Kachuk. Um, his advanced metrics are insane. We know this, right? Shot and chance generation for uh, Kachuk is just ridiculous. At all strengths last season, um, he was third overall in shots and goal per 60 and individual scoring chances for 60. Brady Kachuk, he does that. All right. He's crazy. Um, one of the big issues with Kachuk is he's a chucker. All right. Brady Kachuk is a chucker. He shoots pucks from the parking lot. I don't know what the hell this man's doing. Um, and his conversion rates leave a little bit uh, to be desired, don't they? He's uh, He's got a career average shooting percentage of 9.4, which is that that show ain't no good, you know? Um, so he, he's never been an efficient shooter, but I, I feel like we can, uh, he's still a young guy. So I think that he's got a little bit more to give. And, uh, you know, obviously if he sh shoots a little more efficiently, we're going to see a few more goals, more points, right? But like you said, Matt, at this point, this guy's almost guaranteed to get over 300 shots on goal, 200 hits. I mean, what the hell? That's where the conversation starts and ends for me. If you're going to argue Brady Kachuk, he, his peripherals are ridiculous, right? And if you think that he can be a little bit more efficient, you know, I like truthfully, I have him projected for uh, 87 points with 40 goals. That's kind of what I look at Kachuk this season. I projected McCarr for 89 points. All right, so, I mean, McCarr's, he's like a forward out there. So, you know, I, I think McCarr's probably the right answer, but you could argue Kachuk, I think, and it, like if he can be more efficient, which I think is a possibility, especially at even strength, um, you, you might be able to lean Kachuk there. I don't know. What do you think about that, Matt? I think, you know, the point projection in the high 80s, I think is accurate. And to me, the question for Brady Kachuk is, is he actually fairly close to his ceiling? It's a great ceiling, but I'm glad you mentioned the finishing. The finishing is a problem for him. And he is a volume generator. He crashes that net. A lot of his chances come from in tight. Mm -hmm. And I think at this point, we're getting close to knowing who he is. Because even if you compare him to Kale McCarr, well, defensemen, they take longer to mature. Brady Kachuk's been in the league now for a good half decade, right? Went right out of the NHL, or right out of the draft, right to the NHL 2018. So we've had a decent sample size now of Brady. And I'm not surprised to see the numbers take a big jump last year because the quality of teammates around him is getting a lot better. But if you compare him even to his brother, Matthew, Matthew is the driver on the lines he plays on, whereas Brady is playing with a driver, and that driver is now Tim Stutzla. So I do wonder if this is peak Brady. It's still great, but I don't know if we're going to get a peak Brady that's you know, 40, 50 goals and 90, 100 points with all the hits and shots. I think he's going to settle in as a 35-goal guy, 80, 85-point guy. Yep, that makes sense to me. I mean, you know, like we mentioned as well, in a category league, I think you can definitely make the case for taking Brady Kachuk over Kale McCarr. Like, you can make the case for taking this man in the top six. On You know, I mean, that's not what I would like to do. I like to get elite offensive production, even in the Cats league. But this guy's a freak, you know. <laughs> so um, I do like Ottawa in general for a bit of a bounce back, at even strength especially. That, that team was not good. They were not efficient at even strength. Their power play was incendiary. Great power play. But these guys weren't converting, right? So I... I'm banking on a little bit, even just give me a percent, Brady. What are you doing? Give me a percent on your shot. Let, let, let's see. Let's get 40 goals in there. That'd be nice. That, that's really the only chance you're taking Brady Kachuk over McCarr, although you're at the turn, right? So we, we could take both, right, Matt? Does that sound good? I mean, I have them ranked very close together. My own current rankings, top 300 in daily faceoff. I have McCarr 14, Brady Chuck, Kachuk 19. So theoretically, in my system, they could both be there at the turn. Bang, bang. Two great picks in a row. Love it. You're loving life there. Um, thanks for bringing that up too. I, I did want to mention that. I'm going to, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll touch on your rankings a little bit. You've released a top 300 there at daily face off. It's great. Um, I love that. And I checked out the pot, uh, the podcast there. Puck Pooley's kind of discussing some of your picks. So really good stuff. Nice work, my man. It's such a grind to rank these players, isn't it? It is. It's an extremely long process yep. uh, because before I'm even writing the bios, basically what I'm doing is just populating the list with every single player in the league, and the way I rank is I just pretend I'm drafting. Each name that I input into this, the system, I say, okay, would I pick him over him? No? Okay, well, now I know where they're ranking. And I do that over and over, start with about 500 players and work my way down to about 300. But it's a long process. 
Yeah, I love that. I've been projecting players myself, not 300, but I'm doing full projections. So I think it'll be end up being around like 150. But yeah, that is just a grind. Um, you know, <laughs> I get like a shooting pain right in my head here. I don't know what's happening, but uh, um, yeah, I'm excited. It's a really thoughtful list that you created there. So great work to you, my man. Um, well, I've got you just on the, we're, we're talking about Kale McCarr and value over replacement. Um, what are your thoughts on value over replacement in drafts? Is that a strategy that you sort of utilize or are you kind of taking uh, best player available? Uh, I, I think value over replacement matters more in certain seasons. And maybe that's a cop-out answer, but I really think it's true. There are certain seasons in which a certain player at a certain position can really lord over the field, and it feels like it's almost a cheat code to draft that player. There are other seasons when I feel like the tiers are more condensed. And right now, I think we're more condensed than we were a couple of seasons ago. A couple of seasons ago, if you look at Andre Vasilevsky as an example – I think his value over replacement goaltender was so high mm. relative to everyone else that I justified ranking him. I think it was third overall. I had him a few years ago. I think right now, just it's cyclical, right? Yes, Connor McDavid is in a tier of his own, but it's not like you're choosing between him and, some, him and someone else. He's number one. Other than that, I think that the tiers of players are a lot more condensed at the moment. And if we're looking at even Kale McCarr, for example, it's not inconceivable that Erasmus Dahlin jumps up to his level this year, right? So I don't mm -hmm. think we're seeing the biggest discrepancies at the moment. Yeah, no, I love that. It, there's some amazing defensemen too. Like I love, I love the value over replacement. I, I, something I usually try and utilize like guys like, you know, Yossi, I ended up picking Yossi in a couple drafts a little earlier than probably other people might just for that value over replacement. But there's so many other guys. I love that you mentioned Darlene as well. I'm excited about his season. Like, I think that guy's just going to fly. I love the, the Sabres this year just to potentially make the playoffs. So that's an exciting fantasy team. All right. Matt took the round one there. He's he got my car. That's the right answer, buddy. All right, we're, we're giving it to you. We're now we're going with our second pick here. It's round three. We're pick 30 and we're looking for a center. We've we're staring at Braden point and Elias Pedersen of the Vancouver Canucks. Who are you taking out of those two studs? Oh, I will not stand for this insult to Elias Pedersen. How is he available so late in this fictional draft? To me, this is a borderline first round pick Elias Pedersen, right? If you look at how his role changed last year, he breaks out into the hundred point tier under Rick Tockett, his role changes. He becomes in all situations forward. He leads the NHL in shorthanded goals. To me, what Pedersen's doing is sustainable because of the big jump in his ice time. So we're seeing more volume on top of the great skill he already possesses. So I expect him to finish in a different tier altogether than Braden Point. Point, yes, of course, coming off that monster season. But if we look at the recent sample of Point seasons, he's been fighting hard to even be a point-per-game player more often than not the last several years. I think last year it looks more like an anomaly than the norm. So to me, this ain't even close, man. I'm going to Elias Pedersen. And again, I want to apologize if you're listening to this, Elias. We didn't mean to put you so low in this fictional draft. Nice. You know, I appreciate that. I know Elias Pedersen, big listener of the show. So shout out to <laughs> shout out to Elias Pedersen. Thank you for your service, my man. Uh, Matt and I are together on this. I got to take Pedersen as well. Uh, you know, it, like you said, it's to me, this is a little bit late. This is based on Yahoo ADPs. So he's kind of in and around here on Yahoo, which, you know, whatever. Yahoo's, there are a bunch of Yahoo's at Yahoo right now. I don't know what the hell's happening. Like fix your positional situation there. What are you doing? Um, but yeah, I can't in good conscience not pick PD here, uh, but it's not a landslide or anything. I, th I think Braden Point was a guy I was excited about last season because of his value in drafts. His ADP was, was ridiculous. He was getting no respect. His ADP was like 100. And then he popped for 51 goals, buddy. Oh, my God. Um, so, you know, and that said, too, he's the top center of the perennial Stanley Cup, you know, contenders, Tampa Bay Lightning, right? So, um, unfortunately, the value's gone bye-bye for Braden Point, right? You get 51 goals. Now you're ranked uh, up here at 30, which is probably too high, right? That That's probably too high for Braden Point. So, he also did that by shooting a career-high 21.7%. Buddy, no. All right? That's, you're redlining your shooting percentage Chances are that's going to come down. That's going to regress to the mean, right? So, and he also played all 82 games, which is something he hadn't done since his second season in the league. All right. So Braden Point, you know, it's it's a great season. I actually have Point uh, projected for 86 points, which is, you know, I think that that's still, that's a reasonable projection for me. At, you know, maybe a little bullish still, but I mean, his floor to me is super solid just because of his access to Kucherov and, and that power play, right? That power play is going to be great. No question, regardless of how the team is. So 
I like that, but I just don't expect career high efficiency next season. But uh, for me, I'm taking PD all day. Like we said, he's arrived. All right. And, and I agree with you. I think like, I love that he's getting talked about in the first round. I wouldn't take him in the first round, but I mean, he scored 102 points last season. And I agree 100% with what you said. This is sustainable. Like the, the, the only thing that changed with Pedersen is he upped his shot count, right? He, he, he went from, you know, uh, 20, 2021, uh, five on five shooting, uh, sorry, his shots on goal per 60 in 2021 or 6.01. And he upped that to 7.9 the next year, right? Shots on goal per 60. That's great. So, but his efficiency stayed the same shooting percentage, uh, very in line with his career numbers. Um, like you said, he was getting those shorthanded points. So yeah, I love Pedersen. I think everything's sustainable. My only issue, uh, of not projecting him higher, like I projected him for 92 points, but, I think those shorthanded points go away. Like he led the league in shorthanded points. I've I've seen interviews with Tockett where he's saying he doesn't want to use Pedersen or Miller really in that role anymore. So I mean, it's not nothing, right? That's nine points, right? So, but everything else to me feels like that. We know who this guy is. He's broken through. He's. I think the shots are here to stay, and his efficiency is similar to every other season. So yeah, I don't know. What do you, what do, you, do you think they're going to use uh, Pedersen on the on the penalty kill there, Matt? Yeah, you know, with the change in deployment, I'll believe it when I see it because to me it wasn't broke. They really found something. They were the most dangerous shorthanded duo, those two, down the stretch last season. Yeah. So I don't understand why Talkett would want to tinker with that. I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, I expect him at least mm -hmm. to get some run. I don't think you're going to be pulling Petey completely off special teams on that side, on the shorthand side. And for that reason, you know, and even just in general, the ice time increase and also just the idea that Petey is – is committed verbally, openly to being more of a 200 foot player. I yeah. have him as my number 10 overall player this year. I haven't ranked one spot ahead of Mitch Marner because to me, you're going to get a lot of the same production, all situations play that you get from Marner, but with much more goal scoring upside than a Marner. So that's why I have him so high. Braden Point, I have down at number 34. And for the reason that you mentioned, I even have it in my rankings, the shooting percentage. That's what I noticed yeah. immediately yeah. with Braden Point. Not sustainable. It's not like Andre Kuzmenko unsustainable, which is that's like another planet, but it's still unsustainable. So I think that projection in the mid eighties is perfect for point. Yeah, no, I love that. And plus Pedersen brings the periffs too. He was the second, uh, I think he was the second forward in the league in terms of blocks behind Austin Matthews. Who, who projected that? You know, Austin Matthews leading forward in blocks next up PD. What? No, that makes no sense. Um, my one thing with the, with the penalty kill, just to finish that conversation, Canucks were dead last in the penalty kill. So yeah, they were, they were dangerous for sure, but they can't stop the puck from going in the net. So I think that is probably why they're moving Pedersen and Miller off there. Like, come on, guys. No, like stop hanging out at the red line. Uh, that's why they brought in Teddy Bluger. He's going to he's gonna do some stuff and some other guys there. So, yeah. But either way, I mean, beauty player, I think it's an easy choice for Petey. Okay, we're together on that. All right. Next up, we're, we're all the way into round six, and we're looking at some aging beefers. All right, that sounds weird, but uh, we're going with it. All right. It's pick 73. We're looking at Jamie Benn. And Chris Kreider. So again, this is uh, these guys are close in ADP on Yahoo. So that's why I'm, I'm going with these two guys. Who are you taking here, Matt? Jamie Ben or Chris Kreider? What are you doing? It, it's tough because with players of their type, those power forwards, their games can fall off a cliff suddenly. Mm -hmm. So you do have to be careful with that type of player. And we saw with Jamie Ben, he went from leading scorer in the league, eventually had double hip surgery. Suddenly he fell off a cliff. Then he comes back out of nowhere in his mid 30s with that bounce back season, which I am pretty suspicious about. That's why I lean toward Chris Kreider. Kreider, yes, it's possible we're gonna see a sudden decline from him. And I did have him as a bust going into last year, coming off the 50 plus goal season. That obviously was not gonna be sustainable. That said, Kreider is not nearly as far removed from his peak, from his prime years. He's someone who is known to keep himself in unbelievable physical condition as well. So if anyone is able to age as that type of player archetype, it's it, uh, gracefully, it's Kreider. Plus, we know that Kreider's role is safe. Jamie Benn, he's not touching the top line in Dallas ever again. That belongs to Jason Robertson now, whereas Chris Kreider, typically you see him on the first line as left winger with Mika Zibanejad. Usually have Artemi Panarin playing on the second line. So either way, you feel very secure that Kreider is in a plum scoring role. So I lean his way. And in my mind, it's not a tough decision. For me, it's an instant answer, Chris Kreider. No, I love that. Um, I, I do feel that I agree with you, by the way, I, I got to go Kreider here too, but I do feel these players are more similar than most people think, right? So you and I are both taking Kreider here, but Ben cooked Kreider last season in terms of fantasy points, right? Like, yes, he did. That's fair. Yeah. 
78 points for Jamie Ben, 54 for Chris Kreider. And we're both taking Kreider. And I, I don't think it's really that close. I'm with you on that, Matt. So, um, but I mean, Jamie Ben was bolstered by amazing power play numbers, right? And he had a comeback in even strength points as well. He's he's clearly got some chemistry with Wyatt Johnston there. So, and they played most of the season together. So yeah, Jamie Ben, like you said, out of nowhere, age 34. Dear God, who who uh, who projected that? I don't think so. But same as Braden Point, like the uh, Jamie Ben shooting percentage, career high by far at 17.6%. No. All right. That's, that's the, he's redlining, right? So that's not going to happen again. Uh, to me, this last season, absolute ceiling Jamie Ben at this point in his career. And we can't chase performances in drafts, right? We got to, you know, we got to be smart. And I, I think the opposite happened with Kreider, right? His shooting percentage dropped way off, especially on the power play, right? Um, you know, is, and that showed in his power play points, right? He was ridiculous on the power play uh, in 2021, 37 points. I think he had something stupid, like 26 goals. What the hell? Uh, also, uh, whenever I talk about Chris Kreider, this is off topic, but one of the longest necks in the league. Have you seen this man's neck? You see it in that anytime you get his his photo from the new picture day, it's always like looking at a draft. It's true. Just ridiculous. I don't know. It's like a golf ball on a straw. I don't know what's happening. Um, yeah, that's that's neither here nor there. We'll edit that out in post. Don't worry. We'll we'll get the grid of that, Matt. Um, <laughs> but I, I do think Kreider has more to give on the power play, right? I think he's going to get over 20 points on the power play, which he only got 17 last season. So I think that'll be better. Um, Kreider, to me, and, and some other Rangers too, they definitely suffered a bit in the last quarter when they brought in Patrick Kane and Tarasenko, because those guys, they, they take minutes, they take, you know, puck touches, right. And, uh, Kreider's, um, deployment actually went down by a couple minutes in the last quarter there. So I think that was kind of just a, a hail Mary. They were trying to, you know, bolster their team and win the Stanley cup didn't work out. So I'm, I'm kind of excited that it's going back to normal, uh, a bit next season. I think Kreider should do better. And I also think his role is safe. So I, pro I projected Kreider for 65, including 37 goals and Ben for 60. I think that's, kind of where I'm at. Um, they both have amazing perifs, but I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's pretty accurate. And I think it's a good point about the usage with the Rangers in the playoffs. And there is, I believe, an invisible pressure when you give up assets, when you give up picks, prospects, to bring in someone, you're not going to stick them on the fourth line. It's going to yeah. make it look like you're showing up your GM if you're the coach and doing so. So, of course, we're going to see that big deployment for Tarasenko and Kane, even though, of course, yes, they play a different side than Kreider, but in terms of power play, all that kind of stuff, there are more mouths to feed. So I think right now, I don't see Blake Wheeler, for example, being a major threat to that. Obviously, mm -hmm. he plays the other side. He could end up being Kreider's line mate, the way things are projecting right now. So I like the mini bounce back from Kreider and the, and the mini regression, negative regression for Jamie Benn. Yeah, I think I'm so with you on that. Um, I, ben is just a player I wanted to bring up as well, just because, yeah, he, he, I've, I in the the draft that I'm doing, like they're they're – Good fantasy managers, like engaged fantasy managers, Ben is falling as he should, right? But we're looking at, you know, this is Yahoo ADPs, and this guy's around pick 73. No, do not take Jamie Ben around pick 73. Don't take Kreider at pick 73 either, for that matter. Like, I think that's a little bit early for both these men. Um, you know, definitely Jamie Ben. So I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention. This man's going to fall off for sure. Um, and yeah, I think Kreider, like you said, he's going to bounce back a little bit. So there we go. That long necked beauty, Chris Kreider. We're taking a ride. Yeah. Feels good. All right. Let's move on. We're now we're into round nine where we're cooking in the draft here. It's pick 113, and we're in the market for maybe our second or third D and we're staring down Seth Jones or Darnell nurse. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, this is interesting because it's much tougher of a decision than it was even a year ago. I do have Seth Jones as a bounce back player that I'm pretty interested in. I had a story recently about potential league winners for your pool this year. And I had Seth Jones on that list because I think a, he actually was a little bit underrated last year. Plus minus was terrible, but he wasn't a zero in terms of the fantasy value he delivered. He was a plus contributor in the goals category, the banger categories. He had no one around him in Chicago. And now you have the Connor Bedard carnival starting up. You have Taylor Hall added to that team. Maybe someone like Kevin Korchinski makes the team, Lucas Reichel. Overall, the talent pool is improving there. So you are going to see, I think, a spike in Seth Jones' point total. That said, I can't bring myself to pass up a Darnell Nurse for Seth Jones because you just want to hit your wagon to as many pieces of the Oiler offense mm -hmm. as you can. Yes, it seems like Darnell Nurse is starting to hit his offensive ceiling. I don't think you're going to ever see him be a 60-point player, but he just does so many different things well here in fantasy. He loves to fire the biscuit. He is a big source of hits, blocks. If you count penalty minutes in your league, he can help there. 
plus minus is probably going to be solid on this Euler team just by virtue of them scoring so many goals. So to me, he's still a really valuable asset that just is the king of the combo meal on defense. So I lean nurse, but it's a lot closer than I would have thought even a year ago. Yeah, absolutely. Um, nurse had a career high last season. I just looked that up. Yeah. 43 points. That's, that's his career high there in Edmonton. So um, yeah. And he's obviously getting paid, uh, you know, pretty well. <laughs> that's a contract that's, you know, uh, Oiler fans not too happy with maybe, but um, you know, in terms of a category league, I think nurse is the easy answer there. Um, he just brings more to the table. Like I said, shots, hits, blocks, you know, that's, that's what we need there from our, from our D man. But yeah, I was a bit surprised that I, I saw you took nurse there just cause yeah, I did read your article about Seth Jones being a potential league winner and I agree with it. Um, you know, they, these guys are similar players to me. Um, and I don't have any question that nurse is going to be the better player at even strength. Um, you know, but he isn't getting any power play time, nothing, uh, you know, and if Bouchard for some reason goes down, I, I think nurse is probably the next one up there. I, like, I don't see. Who else are they going to put up there? At home, maybe? I, I don't know. So th there's potential that Nurse gets on power play one at some point if Bouchard falters or gets injured or something like that. But um, other than that, he's he's getting zeros on the power play with the big boys. So um, that really caps what he's capable of, in my opinion. But obviously, his perips are going to be legendary, right? He's a big piece of what's going on there in Edmonton. So uh, my issue with Nurse, though, is that um, – and Jones, they both had similar points last season. Um, you know, nurse with 43, Seth Jones at 37, but, um, look at who they each had access to their respective teams, right? Like you said, you want to get someone who, who's, you know, access to the two of the best players two the top two best players in the league nurses there with them at even strength. No question. So he's got an advantage, but, um, Jones does stuff too. I got to take Seth Jones because, um, his perifs are reasonable as well. He's going to get over hundred hits, hundred blocks, but, um, he's going to be the, the man on that power play there. And, you know, I think I, I think it's common sense that Chicago's power play is going to be better than it was last season, right? I love the addition of Taylor Hall there. Um, you know, even Corey Perry. I mean, that's a funny signing, right? Like for that money, but I, he's going to help, right? Getting a veteran guy in there that's won before. That you know, I, I just like that signing, and I'm so I was so glad to see Hall go to Chicago there to just help this guy, you know, kind of develop, right? But it's going to be better, and Jones is going to be the man on that power play. I don't think anyone's coming for those minutes, so I think they're similar at even strength, and Jones is going to get more power play minutes. So that's why I got to go set Jones here. But like I said, category league, it's Nurse all day. I don't know what, how, where, where do you see Bedard this season? Like, what's your, do, do you have a projection for him, or how do you think he's going to do? Yeah, I mean, and before I get to Bedard, there's one more point. I don't. I want to give yeah. you props because you've you've almost swayed me on Seth Jones. Mm -hmm. I, I still think if the nature of this exercise is you have to pick one or the other right now in your draft, I still lean Nurse. But I would be an advocate for, in general, picking Seth Jones over Darnell Nurse because Seth Jones should be available far later. You could mm -hmm. wait several rounds, take Seth Jones, and maybe get a pretty similar player to Nurse especially with the power play factored in. So I want to give you props to that, raise some very good points there. In terms of Connor Bedard, where you rank him starts with evaluating where you think he sits on the generational talent scale. In terms of what he's accomplished relative to his age, I think he absolutely fits the profile. I think he mm -hmm. absolutely is going to be the best new talent coming into the league since Connor McDavid. I'm 100.000% a believer in Connor Bedard. So I am fairly aggressive in projecting him. I think his floor is going to be, I don't know. I think even a disastrous season for him would be 70 points. I think the floor is more like 80 points. I could see 90 points as a rookie as well. Wouldn't surprise me because he does so many things well. He has the ability to distribute the puck. He can move. He's a great skater, but he also has that electric release. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like he's this amalgamation of several different star players and all of their traits like the ultimate creative player in EA sports. You've taken different traits and put them all into one super player. So based on that, I'm a big fan of his, but I don't necessarily have him ranked the highest out of every so-called industry expert. I don't know if I count as one of them, but if you, if you see consensus industry consensus lists, I still think you have to be careful. So for example, let's say we're talking Braden point. Braden point is someone we know is going to get 80 points. Do you want to draft someone you think is going to get 80 points? or someone you know is going to get 80 points. So that's the price point The price point you have to watch out for in a redraft league for Connor Bedard. You don't want to take him earlier than anyone who is a lock for point-per-game production. Once you get to the if he picks, maybe he'll do it, maybe he won't, then you have my blessing. Go ahead and reach on Connor Bedard. 
Yeah, but Bedard is making some uh, some interesting decisions for fantasy managers this season because, yeah, like all the stuff you said tracks, right? Like this guy's a generational talent. Um, he's going to be amazing, but we don't know for sure. We haven't seen him play in the NHL, right? So uh, I'm I'm with you. In in my drafts, I like to be safe, you know, and I don't. I usually stay away from rookies unless it's like the last two picks, you know, something like that. Then I'll take a swing, right? And I'm still doing that. I'm doing that with Logan Cooley. I'm doing, I've got Brant Clark in a bunch of spots, like just trying to, you know, just, okay, we'll see what happens. If it doesn't work out, you drop them. But yeah, you're spending good draft capital on Connor Bedard in this year's draft. And, you know, it's, if, I wouldn't say it's boom or bust. Cause like you said, I don't think there's a bust unless he gets injured. There's no bust, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, it just doesn't feel good. Right. Yeah. Like if you're staring, staring at someone like Braden point who, you know, like his role is secure, he's done it before. Right. Yeah, um, but I'm so excited to watch. I, it, this is a weird thing to say, but I'm just excited to watch the Blackhawks this year, the, the young talent, and just see what this man's capable of doing. The Calder race in particular, if this is going to be a really fun year. It's It's been so boring in the last couple of years. Like, Matty Beniers, I mean, thank you for your service, but ah, come on, you know, like, this guy's like, you know, getting 16 minutes time on ice in Seattle, for God's sake. Uh, this this is going to be epic. So, um, anyways, we're digressing on Connor Bedard. I just, I'm, I wanted to get your take there. I love the 90 point ceiling. Oh my God! Imagine if he did that in Chicago this year. That that would be that would be a special season for sure. All right. Sorry. Go ahead, Matt. You got something? Oh, yeah, I was just thinking. Hey, Cindy Crosby did it. Alex Ovechkin did it, and scoring is higher than it was in 0506 right now. So don't forget about that. Yeah. Also, um, one thing I like about Bedard is it's kind of his just the way he he uh, the way he projects himself or presents himself. Right. Mentally, he seems really strong, like he's locked in. I remember after the World Juniors, like someone was interviewing him like, oh, are you excited about like talking to him about his personal achievements? He's like, no, not nothing about me. Like, I, I don't want to talk about myself. I want to talk about the team. Right. Like and just seeing him work out in the gym, like I saw some video of him and Connor McDavid working out. It's just like, oh, my God, this guy's this guy's a beast. Like. You know, why, like his quads are huge. What the hell's going on? I don't know. I'm just envious of, envious of those quads. All right. That's, that's where I'm going with that. All right. We're moving on. We're making our fifth pick here. We're in zero G territory. All right. You have successfully waited to the 11th round, Matt, to pick your first goalie. All right. Zero G. Okay. And we're staring at Darcy Camper or Jonas Corposalo. Who are you taking? Oh, Blake, I have to disappoint you. Just be boring with this pick, okay? So there's certainly some upside with Eunice Corpusello. And obviously Ottawa is a team on the rise. He's being given a plum role. He's obviously going to be the starter there. He's fresh off maybe the best wall-to-wall -wall season of his career in terms of regular season performance at least, right? So there's reason to be excited about Eunice Corpusello. But is he a safe pick? No, he is not. Is Darcy Kemper a safe, a safe pick? Yes, he is. And it's true that Kemper is playing for a Washington team that's in decline, but mm -hmm. even on a, a team that missed the playoffs last year, Darcy Kemper still returned pretty good value relative to his draft position. Obviously not what he was as an avalanche goaltender during the regular season, but he was still an above average fantasy commodity in net. The volume is going to be there. You know that Darcy Kemper is going to start at least 50 games. And Washington is, on de is in decline, but it's not like they're going to be in – contention for the number one overall pick so you're probably still going to be able to get you know 25 30 wins at minimum out of darcy kemper rate stats should be decent whereas Eunice corpusalo the floor is oh he's back to what he was a couple years ago he can't even keep a save percentage above 900 he's back to the goaltender he was in the playoffs with the la kings when he wasn't very good and he got out dueled in a series in which edmonton didn't get good goaltending either right so to me, because the track record of success with Eunice Corposalo is a lot smaller than Kemper's, he's a risky pick, even though you could argue his upside is higher than Kemper's right now. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the crux of it right there. I think I'm taking Corposalo, but you're absolutely right. Uh, Kemper is a much safer pick, and you, got, you have to think about those things. Like, we're at pick 132, right? We're taking our first goalie, like... I don't know. It's maybe not the time to be taking swings. I I don't think that Corpusalo is a huge swing, but he is riskier than Kemper for me. Um, you know, I just I like the team outlook better in Ottawa, and that's how I sort of value goalies. Like that's where I start anyway, right? Um, and last year Ottawa they were obviously decimated by injuries uh, in goal, right? And they 
they, their defensive metrics were terrible. Um, middle of the pack, Corsi against per 60, shots against per 60, but um, they were 10th worst in scoring chances against per 60. So that, that, that show ain't no good, right? It's not, not an amazing place for a goalie to be. So, but I do expect that to regress positively a little bit. And um, I do expect them to be better at even strength. So a little bit more goal support for Corpus Allo. And then plus, I just like the way Corpus Allo played in LA. Um, I think this is a guy who's never been the number one. Uh, he's been a career backup, right? And I, I do think that he can really thrive with the extra starts. And I think that he's the one A there in Ottawa. Like that's what his contract really says to me. Um, you know, and then add a full season of uh, Josh Norris, Jacob Chikrin in there, and Tarasenko, right? Uh, I just think the Sens are going to be better, right? Kemper, to me, took advantage of playing an amazing goalie environment in Colorado, right? They just have a great place. You, you can put any goalie in there. Like now, Alexander Georgiev. Yeah, he's a he's like the fourth goalie off the board. Like what? You know, yeah. because he plays for Colorado. They, they're they great defensively, right? It's a great environment for them. So um, he parlayed that into starting role in Washington, and I wasn't too impressed last year. But I think there's a better path for starts for Kemper than there is for Corpus Allo, right? Um, so that, that it, both of these picks make sense. I think in a bubble, I'm taking Corpus Allo because I'm a positive guy, all right? I'm an, I'm an optimist, and I think um, I'm excited. I liked what I saw in LA. Uh, obviously, the playoffs didn't really go their way, but that wasn't just on him. I mean, they're playing Edmonton, right? Like LA kind of got away from the things that made them successful. So, um, yeah, there you go. I don't know. I'm taking Corpy, and I feel good about it. I don't know. Where, <laughs> what do you think? Um, uh, I actually like Lingren as well in Washington. Do you think Lingren eats into Kemper's starts a little bit? Because he did play well when Kemper went down. Yeah, I do think that Charlie Lindgren is one of the better backups in the league. So I do think he's not going to be, you know, we're not looking at the days of Marty Broder and Scott Clemenson when, you know, where Lindgren's going to play seven games. So yes, I do think you could get 20, 25 starts out of Lindgren and they might be above average too. So I am a fan of his, but with Darcy Kemper, you know, I think what's happened with him is he seems to be carrying around this label as the goalie who was just okay during a Stanley Cup run because that season with Colorado, during the playoffs, his numbers were very mediocre. People mm. seem to forget that he took a stick in the eye in the first round, missed some time, came back, was never quite right the rest of the playoffs. He might have been playing through it, trying to get his vision back on track. We don't know exactly what was going on there, but he had a tremendous regular season. He was also really good a lot of the time in Arizona. And if you look at the career track record of Darcy Kemper, there's a lot more good than bad. And I just think for some reason that playoff run is what sticks in people's head and it causes them to devalue him. I think he is a high floor, very reliable goaltender. And if we're picking our first goalie, like you said, Blake, I want safe for my first goalie off the board. I'm going zero G. I love it. I'm taking the hits here. Oh my God. Um, yeah, I, I, that's a really good point. Just in terms of the consistency that Kemper has brought through his entire career. Right. Uh, obviously he did have an amazing season in Colorado there, but uh, you know, the metrics looking at, just through, throughout his career have been pretty consistent. Whereas Corpus Salo, yeah, he's hot or cold, right? So you're making sense to me, my man. I don't know. I'm going to have to change my mind, but we'll figure that out later. All right. <laughs> Last one. We're in sleeper territory here. All right. And uh, yeah, I am going to pick your brain for some sleepers at the end of the episode here. So definitely stick around for that, everybody. But uh, we're in round 13 and we're at pick 156. And we're looking at Jake DeBrusque or Sam Bennett. Who are you taking here? Yeah, that's a good, that's a tough one. And, and again, I'll give you plops, break uh, plops. I'll give you props. I won't give you plops. That's what that guy in that flight that got canceled just did to everybody. Oh yeah. Um, Thank you for bringing that up. He gave plops. Uh, but I, again, these are really tough conundra, if you will, because these players are valued very similarly. I think with Jake DeBrusque, you're getting more ceiling. It seems like the last couple of years, once Bruce Cassidy was out of the picture, especially, it seemed like he began to tap into his goal scoring upside and of course, just when he starts to do that, what does Boston do? They lose their top two centers. So suddenly, yeah. the supporting cast for Jake DeBrus, the deployment is very much up in the air. If David Pasternak is the first line right winger now, because he basically Pasternak's line was the second line last year, does that mean DeBrus is on the second line? Does that mean he's playing with Charlie Coyle? It doesn't exactly get me excited. Based on that, I'm going to go with the safer pick, and that's Sam Bennett. With the caveat being, are we talking a banger format or at least some light? waiting for banger format because to me sam bennett is kind of reminds me a lot of joel erickson x statistical profile he can get you 25 goals he can get you quite a few shots and hits and i think he's an underrated asset so sam bennett is a guy i kind of try to target every year in my main league but that's because it's a banger format so i'm gonna lean toward my bennett bias admittedly though i'm leaving myself open for a good counterattack. so show me what you got 
<laughs> sure. Well, first off, I love Sam Bennett too. And I keep going to that well, right? Because of, 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 first off, he shows out in the metrics that I like. I mean, shots on goal per 60, individual scoring chances, four per 60, elite levels, right? He's, he's over 10 on both of those, which is what I like to see, but he just hasn't popped Sam Bennett. It's, it's pissing me off. Like, you know, he's getting insane deployment. Uh, well, he's getting good deployment at even strength. Right. And, uh, during the season, he only had a 35% power play share, which is not amazing. But in the playoffs, Sam Bennett got, you know, he got a 65% power play share there with uh, the Panthers. So um, who knows what we're going to see this upcoming season. There's, you know, obviously some injuries in Florida now as well. So I don't know how that's going to affect everything. But this all said, I got to go with Jake DeBrusque, um, you know, like you said, for the for the upside play. And I, I feel there's a better chance that that he gets there, right? Because because Bennett has had opportunity for for a lot of years and he hasn't really taken advantage of it. And he's not the only one in Florida, right? They they were they were middling in their their efficiency, their shot percentage last season. That's why I'm actually big on a lot of Florida Panthers coming into the season here for fantasy, because I think that's all going to regress positively. But uh, for me, Bangers Cats League, uh, the decision is definitely easier. I would take Bennett there 100 out of 100 because he's a beefer. But um, yeah, definitely a case to be made for DeBrusque. I think that DeBrusque power play time on ice is more of a sure thing than Bennett's, right? We saw him in the playoffs get the power play, but I think that DeBrusque is getting power play one with these beauties in Boston. I don't think that's a question. Um, I also think that DeBrusque is more capable of creating his own offense than Sam Bennett is. Um, they're both, you know, in, in the top six on good offensive teams, but I just think that kind of wherever you put DeBrusque in the lineup, I think he can, he can get the job done on his own, right? Obviously. Yeah. We're not excited about Charlie Coyle, right? They just signed Danton Heinen. So I don't know, or for, for a PTO. So we'll see what goes on there. Um, but I, I do feel that DeBrusque is going to get access to that top line there in Boston at some point. Right. Um, but yeah, I, oh God, I feel more comfortable that, uh, DeBrusque is going to convert at a higher rate than Bennett as well. Right. So his shooting percentage consistently higher than Bennett's. Um, this all said, I like both players this season for late round targets. Uh, and I would draft both of them comfortably as long as it's at value. Right. I wouldn't want to reach for either of these guys. Um, you know, just cause they haven't quite proved that they can be the guy and be relied on for consistency, fan uh, consistent fantasy production. So I don't know at 156, I, I'm, I'm liking this. This is all right. This is, this is value for me, but yeah, I'm taking the upside play with the brusque. I don't know. Yeah. And you know, I think I'm willing to concede an, an L on this one because I think you're right about the upside play. And I think there are more paths to success for DeBrusque than maybe there are for Sam Bennett. Like you said, the opportunities for power play deployment. Also, we know that DeBrusque has played both wings in his career. Yep. Lately, he's had his best success on the right side, but he at least has played a lot of left wing in his career too. So there are certain permutations that could put him in a really good situation. For example, maybe it's not James Van Riemsdyk as has been projected by a lot of people. Maybe it's Jake DeBrusque who ends up the first line left winger and he's playing with Pavel Zaka and David Pasternak. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, ooh, that looks like a pretty plum yep. setup. And maybe there's a path to 35 goals. So I think he is a more skilled player, Sam Bennett, more of a blunt instrument, but I love that blunt instrument. Yeah, I love that description too. That's so accurate. Um, Bennett is just a beefer. Oh my goodness. Like in the playoffs last year, 20 games, 84 hits. Buddy, what, you know, what's wrong with this man? Like who peed in his cornflakes? Somebody, mm -hmm. all right? You don't want to get this man mad. He's a weird Viking, beautiful mustache. Um, I don't know, but let's, let's carry on with that. Um, all right. So that is the battle portion. I feel like, you know, you probably took it, Matt. It, it, this actually, there's no question. All right. You're a legend. I'm just, you know, I'm in, I'm in my basement right now. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> um, but, but, uh, what I, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you've got your top 300 players over on daily face off there. And I would love to talk briefly, uh, just on a couple, couple bits of your rankings, just questions I had, uh, amazing work by the way. Um, one thing I did want to touch on is is you've got, and, and I agree with this, but I'd just like to get your take on it, uh, Victor Hedman over Mikhail Sergachev in your rankings. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah, and that was uh, a difficult decision. And if I remember correctly, I have them side by side. Mm. I think I have them because I was that yeah. torn. I kept juggling, juggling them back and forth, back and forth. So my reasoning was uh, we've been waiting for John Cooper to trust Mikhail Sergachev with that big increase in ice time and just responsibility, and it finally happened, and Sergachev – in just similar to the career trajectory of Victor Hedman, the big, tall, rangy puck movers, they tend to grow into their offense a bit slower. So it finally happened. And based on the pedigree, yes, there's reason to believe that it's here to stay. That said, 
Hedman is still the on the depth chart. He's still the player that's more trusted by Cooper. He's still the player that, if healthy, if all things are equal, is going to play more minutes, more likely to be power play one, more likely to be top pair, and so on and so on. So I still have to give the ever so slight edge to Victor Hedman. Maybe this will be the final year that I do so. But I just think if he gets through a full season, last year he slipped, I think it was to 49 points. I don't have it in front of me, but I believe that was the number. Yeah, I, think you're right. I think he's capable of a rebound back into at least the 50s, maybe even the 60s. I do think he's peaked, but I just want to see Sergeyev do it one more time before I can officially acknowledge that they've, they've switched places. I'm so with you on this, buddy. We're together on this. This is going to be one of my, you know, one of my warmer takes this season. I'm taking Hedman over Sergachev. Um, I you, you see Sergachev going consistently ahead of Hedman in drafts right now. I got Hedman in round seven in one of the best ball drafts I did. Like, what the hell is going on? Victor <laughs> Hedman, this, this guy, for first off, in real life, this guy's uh, elite. He's an elite defenseman. In fantasy, yeah, he's falling to round seven. Oh, my God. So, you know, I, I definitely think, like, Sergachev took power play one last season or a big chunk of it, but Hedman still got 50% of that, right? Mm -hmm. I think that goes back up. I think Hedman's going to take a little bit more of that power play share. And I agree with you one more year. I think one more year I, I'm banking on Victor Hedman and then it's the Sergachev show in my opinion. And I, so. I want to chime in too and just add one little nugget is I talked to Victor about this last spring and this is an important consideration. I think if you're drafting, so I said to to Victor, you know, no hockey player on earth has played more minutes than you in the past three years, and he said that's right. He said it really has affected my ability to train because we played so deep three seasons in a row, and I played the most minutes on the team that played the most games, and I could not even build anything in my offseason training. All my training was built toward just getting myself back to square one, healing up. I couldn't build muscle. I couldn't sort of improve my performance. Suddenly you have a, a Tampa team that's out in spring, earlier in the spring, a first round exit. And that's so much more time for Hedman to get his, bat, his body back on track. So a healthy Hedman, I think, could have quite a bounce back season. This guy's talking to Victor Hedman. Oh, my God. I love Victor Hedman. Uh, yeah, see you at the party, Victor. Uh, that's amazing. And I so agree with you on that. Um, you know, these guys have a lot of mileage, right? And that makes total sense. And it's neat to get the perspective from the man himself, right? Like, yeah, I'm just getting back to square one. Well, you know, I was, I mean, not happy, but I was low-key kind of just glad that Tampa got bounced, right? Like, let these guys rest up. And I mean, for fantasy, right? Like, because that's all I care about. I just care about my fantasy <laughs> team and, and that's it. But uh, yeah, uh, a healthy Victor Hedman, like, I just didn't understand why they would take him off power play one. And and it makes sense to me if his, if, you know, he's hurting, like he's like, we got Sergachev in the wings here who can obviously do some stuff, right? That makes total sense. But one more year, Victor Hedman, we're taking it to the bank. I agree with you. It's a great take. Um, I did want to ask you another question here. Uh, Rantanen, you have at number four in your rankings. And I love that. Uh, you've got him over pasta, Jack Hughes, uh, Austin Matthews, J-Rob. What, what is it you like about Rantanen so much at number four? Well, I always just say that you cannot lose your fantasy draft and you can't win your fantasy draft in round one, but you can lose it. You need to go safe. And to me, Mikko Rantanen is a player at the peak of his powers who is now busting out as an elite goal scorer. He already was known, especially to scouts, as one of the best pure passers on the planet. So he can do everything. He has every tool in his tool belt offensively. He's attached to a team that's still in an elite overall fantasy environment, he's still going to be playing. I think more likely to be playing more with than Nathan McKinnon this year because you're not going to have the option. Yep. He'd be, they, with Colorado second line centers, maybe just as they get a little bit less deep, they're going to have to just sort of load up and make more of a powerhouse top line. So last year we saw a little bit of, of Rantanen playing with JT Comfer. I think you're going to see more of a nuclear option with him and Nathan McKinnon all year round. And just, you know, 50 goals, 100 points, he's established – He's putting up numbers that were the norm for Leon Dreisaitl just a couple of years ago. He's not going to get to that level, but that's an elite commodity. And I think you can count on him to do it again. Peak of his powers in his prime. There's just, I don't think you even need to overthink it. He's just an absolute step. Yeah. You know, I really appreciate your perspective on your drafts and just safety. And um, that's how you win leagues, right? You, you make safe picks and they're not, they're not sexy, right? I don't think like, I'm not getting excited about ranting at four. I'm like, Oh, give me Jack Hughes. Give me Austin Matthews. Give me pasta. Right. And those are all great choices, right? I don't think you're really going to lose picking one of those, but to me, yeah, you, I I've said this in another pod. I think ranting is the safest pick in the first round. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's, it's just not fun. You're like, ah, oh, ranting. And I guess I got to take him. Right. But 
Yeah, you got it 50 and 50, right? The only thing I have with Ranton, and, and this isn't even a big thing, but his his deployment is insane. Like he had over 22 minutes time on ice last season. Even if, if that drops like two minutes, you know, and he still plays 20 minutes, which is still elite deployment, the, the production's going to drop too, right? So he maybe is more like a 95 point player as opposed to like 105 or whatever it was, but it doesn't matter. If he's, he's, if he's healthy and he's out there, he's going to deliver, right? And uh, he's a great goal scorer, great passer, like you said. So, yeah, I love that take. It's really interesting. And lastly, I got to pick your brain. You, you put Mark Stone over Vincent Trocek and Boone Jenner. That's risky bisky, my man. What, what's going on? What, what's your thought process there? It's weird because I surprise myself. Normally, I'm the biggest Mark Stone hater uh, in the draft room because I think he's quite an overrated commodity who just really doesn't contribute much in the shots category, the goals category, except that the actual scoring chance or at least shot output went up last year. And again, I'm not saying I want to pick Mark Stone. I don't, I don't want anything to do with that, that back. I think it's going to continue giving him problems right. throughout his career. But if we're comparing him to the other two players, I think Stone, when he's in the lineup, he's locked into a top line role. He's locked into power play one. And if he can sustain the gains he made, in just scoring chance generation, I think well, maybe actually maybe not top line because obviously if, if the Eichel line with Marcheseau and and Barbashev, I think that was the line last year. Yep. That stays yep. together. But either way, top six and actual minutes, top six minutes. That's the equivalent of first line deployment. Absolutely. So if he can if he can maintain those gains, then maybe he actually is a reasonably valuable fantasy commodity compared to, for example. Boone Jenner, there's a lot more downside this year because Adam Fantilli is coming, my friend. And I don't know for sure that Boone Jenner is going to be able to hold down the first line center job for the whole season. It's only a matter of time before that belongs to Adam Fantilli. It could happen as early as this season. I think the entire fantasy community is sleeping on Adam Fantilli. The last I looked, I think his, his Yahoo ADP was far lower than I expected. I think it was maybe it was NHL.com didn't even have them in their top 250, which blew my mind. I think Adam Fantilli is one of the best prospects to come along in years. So that's a major threat to me to Boone Jenner's playing time. And then if you're not in that first line in Columbus, the supporting cast around you, it drops off in a hurry. Vincent Trocek, this is a player I've always really liked in fantasy. He's an above average contributor in shots and hits. But I just think he's reached the point where his offense is not growing. If anything, it might start to regress mm -hmm. because he plays a pretty hard-nosed style. So we might start to see some aging effects creep in for him as he gets into his 30s. So I like Mark Stone just a little bit better, just based on role. He's the one out of those three that's the safest bet for major deployment and shooting the puck a little bit more, which is what we like to see. We do like to see that. Um, oh, I hate to hear this about Boone Jenner, my man. Oh, my God. No, don't take Boone Jenner off uh, the, the first line. Come on. Um, Boone Jenner is one of my favorite fantasy guys. I, you, you probably, if, if you've seen any of my tweets or anything, yeah, I have, love this man. But, uh, you know, I think Mark Stone, actually, so in terms of your rankings, is it is it per game or is it totals? Like, do you, do you kind of discern between the two? Because I think Mark Stone per game, definitely higher than both those guys. But in terms of totals, like, he's going to miss games. It's it's both. So, and again, it sounds it might sound like a cop out answer, but it's it, when I'm breaking those types of ties, it's kind of on feel. Who's going to help you more in a head to head league? Mark Stone might help you more. He could single handedly win you a match because of his per game mm -hmm. production. If you're in a roto league and you're looking at the season end totals, maybe you drop Stone down a few spots for sure. Cool. No, that makes total sense. Um, I think for me, Mark Stone's he's. I just don't want the headache this year. Like that report came out like. Oh, he's gonna be, you know, in and out of the lineup pretty much the rest of his career. It's like, oh God, no, I don't, I don't, I don't want that. Like he reminds me of like uh, Kawhi Leonard, you know, mm -hmm. in basketball. It's like load management or something. I, I don't want to deal with that. I'll let somebody else deal with that. But yeah, like you said, elite. Uh, I, I think he's an elite option there in Vegas, right? And showed out in the playoffs, obviously, like just played out of his mind. So, all right, well, I love that, and I, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you. If you have one or two sleepers that you're liking for this year, just for our listeners, give, give them what you got, Matt. What do you got? Sure. I think the one I'll, I'll give you one, one obvious sleeper, just, but it's not a sleeper. It's more of a reach. So just make sure you reach on Evan Bouchard. If you look at what he did in the playoffs, he had 17 points in 12 games. It was second most points per game by a defenseman in the playoffs in the last, I, believe, I think it was this century other than Kale McCarr when he won the con smite point per game player, better than a point per game player. If you factor in the playoffs after Tyson Berry was traded, the ceiling for Evan Bouchard is like 80 points, something just off the charts. I think the floor might be 50-60. So 
That's a breakout player that you want. Go ahead and reach two rounds on Evan Bouchard. If you want a deep sleeper that I think could change everything for your team, stash Joseph Wall. I think if you look at the Toronto Maple Leafs, don't worry about Martin Jones. Joseph Wall is not waivers exempt, so it's not like they can send him down. Jones is just insurance. Joseph Wall is a real threat to Ilya Samsonov's playing time. Wall is a much more consistent goaltender. His makeup, I think, game to game is better. I would not be surprised to see him overtake Samsonov. He was better in the playoffs than Samsonov. And if Joseph Wool gets the number one job on a team that's probably going to win 50 games and is sneaky good defensively, the Leafs have a weird reputation. Their defense has been above average the last several seasons. That's a major value in fantasy. That's someone who could change your season. So stash Joseph Wool. I love that. I love that take. It's not the first time I've heard Joseph Wall either. Uh, you know, I think this guy is a viable sleeper and, like you said, a viable threat to Sam uh, Samsonov this season. Um, you know, and Samsonov's not the most healthy guy in the world either, right? Like it, his body might not be made to, you know, play workhorse minutes. So, and I'm, I agree with you, Martin Jones. He's insurance, right? That they're not going to him. He, he's there just so they don't have the debacle that they had last season with the emergency goalies and whatnot, right? But Joseph Wall, yeah, I love that. And this is a guy you can get with your last pick. You know, I don't think people are really going to be drafting Joseph Wall, right? Because Sam Sono's there. But I absolutely agree with you. I think it's a great pick. Buddy, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate having you here, Matt. It's It's been nice meeting you. I really enjoy the content you uh, you and Steven do on Puck Pooley's. Daily Faceoff is insane. I love those articles. So, so keep rolling with that. Why don't you let our listeners know where they can find you on the socials and, and what you got cooking there? Absolutely, Blake. Absolute pleasure to have me on. Uh, it was so much fun going back and forth, sparring with you. You got my brain churning. I might be changing up some rankings. There's some good discussions here that got me Let thinking. Go. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, and if you're looking for content, Daily Faceoff, obviously dailyfaceoff.com. I'll be updating the top 300 more frequently as we get closer. Obviously, training camps we're just getting guys on the ice now, so there's not much to report. But as the injuries start piling up, the different line deployments, I'll start changing them often, making lots of updates for you, dailyfaceoff.com. And you can find me on Twitter at mlarkinhockey. What an absolute beauty. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Matt. Definitely go check out dailyfaceoff.com and uh, check out all the stuff they're doing. And Puck Pooley's as well. Get in there, listen to what these men have to say. It's it's really comprehensive stuff. Actually, I had Steven on here too for, for some draft stuff. And uh, damn. The guy's a savant. Like what? What's you know? And you guys are you guys are some of the hardest workers in the biz. So I love the content you're doing. Keep it going. And thanks so much for being here. That's it, everybody. That's the ADP battle. I took some more hits, and I keep on coming. All right. It's not how many times you get knocked down. It's how many times you get up. Am I right, Matt? Absolutely right. Couldn't have said it better. Bang. All right. We're in agreement on that. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. We got more episodes on the way. But until then, celebrate your day. Bye for now.